Hey everyone, Dr. Brianne Callanan here. Tonight I want to go through a patient case where we utilize the GI map, a qPCR DNA stool test, which I absolutely love. And I really wanted to review this case because it is a great one with the common signs and symptoms that a lot of my patients come to me. So this patient in particular was a 39 year old female, really healthy, really active, doing all of the right things. But what she was finding is that her digestive system, it just didn't feel optimal. She had a lot of digestive upsets, significant bloating, particularly after meals, especially high protein meals. And given the amount that she exercised, all the healthy foods that she was eating, it really didn't make sense why she was having this significant bloating. And we actually did find a lot that was contributing to that on the GI map test. And I'm going to take you through what her results said, what we did from a dietary and lifestyle perspective, as well as some of the supplements we used and how she is feeling now. So on follow-up, after a couple months of working together, she is now able to consume more proteins at each of her meal because she's really into fitness, doing resistance training five times a week, hit training two to three times a week, and yoga as well. So we talked about making sure that the exercise is the appropriate amount for her hormones, making sure to not elevate that stress response too much. But exercise is something that really just brings her joy. Um, it's a part of her routine. It's a part of her career. And I absolutely love fitness too. So we were okay at continuing on that level of fitness because what we were doing is we were optimizing her overall health, really focusing on gut health. And as a result of healing the gut, we actually didn't have to treat any of her hormone imbalances. So she was finding that before her menstrual cycle, she was getting really heavy periods, a lot of PMS, breast tenderness, bloating around her cycle, and through addressing the root cause and treating gut health first, that is actually completely resolved, which is amazing because a significant portion of your immune system in, in your gut, inflammation can lead to hormone imbalances as well. And you can see on her GI map that inflammation was an issue for her. Um, so it just goes to show once you get to the root cause and you address the GI tract first, which is what I do in my practice, a lot of these hormonal issues can resolve on their own without treatment, which is really, really great. Um, so that's what we're continuing to work on. Now she's in maintenance and she's doing really, really well. So let's dive right into her GI map report. I'm going to make this a little bit smaller so that you guys can see the overall results. So this is the very first page of the GI map. This one shows us all the pathogens. So these are the big guys that you might have heard of, like Salmonella, C. difficile, these are the ones that we would all agree in the medical community that if they are present, they either should be monitored because they are transient and they will self-resolve or they need to be treated. Most of the times you will see signs and symptoms that are pretty dramatic with these pathogens, but the great news for her in this case that these were all completely normal, non-detectable. In addition to measuring pathogens, what I really love about the GI map is it looks at the normal or commensal bacteria as well as other things that we can really help to remove to prevent and treat certain GI issues as well as prevent autoimmunity. So the first one is H. pylori. This is the main bacterium that is responsible for gastric ulcers, whether it's in the stomach, also duodenal ulcers, as well as reflux. So this one came back all clear. And I really love the GI map because it not only shows if H. pylori is present, but it also shows the virulence factors, which means how likely is the H. pylori to be causing clinical signs and symptoms. If H. pylori is present, a lot of people actually do carry H. pylori. And as long as you don't have signs and symptoms, as well as your virulence factors are all negative, it doesn't actually have to be treated. So in this case, there was no virulence factors, no H. pylori, so that wasn't the main cause of her bloating. So we need to look a little bit closer. Normal bacteria flora all looked good. Escherichia species was low. So when this one is low, I'm thinking of, is this patient at risk of having more pathogenic E. coli? So having the normal bacteria present, the normal Escherichia species will actually prevent any pathogenic E. coli species for developing. So in this case, she wasn't experiencing UTIs. If she was, and they were E. coli-based UTIs, we would want to help optimize this. Another reason why this could be low, just poor mucosal health as well as inflammation. So we wanted to look at that specifically on the last page, which we will go through as well. But for her overall, her normal bacteria flora looked pretty good. So for this client in particular, if you were to give a lactobacillus-based probiotic, probably wouldn't see very much benefit from it because her lactobacillus as well as her bifido are actually within healthy levels. So this comes into play with precision and individualized medicine that not every single person 
needs to have the exact same supplement. Not every single person needs a probiotic. You really have to look at the history as well as how is the gut behaving right now. And in this case, it looked really good. Overall, we do see that the bacteroides is a little bit low, but if you can see here, this is 10 to the power of 11 and normal is 10 to the power of 11 as well. So this one I wasn't too, too concerned about. Her Formicides bactericides ratio, we can optimize a little bit. I like this number to actually be as low as possible because the lower this is, the less calories you're going to extract from food, less risk of inflammation, less risk of diabetes, as well as fat deposition. In my practice, I work a lot with hormones and weight loss, so I'm focused on getting this ratio as low as possible. In order to lower this ratio, she could include some more prebiotic fibers in her diet, like psyllium husk, as well as resistant starch. A great way to get resistant starch is cooked and then cooled potatoes. Um, that's actually a great way to get resistant starch to help feed these good bacteria in the bacteroides fiber, phylum to help increase those. So you can just you know, bake your potatoes, let them cool, you can heat them back up or eat them cold again to get more of that resistant starch um, or consume more fibers in your diet, whole food fibers. Moving on to the opportunistic bacteria. So this is where it's, it gets really interesting and matches a lot of these clinical signs and symptoms that we're seeing, especially with the bloating. So we're seeing that these bacteria, given the opportunity, they can overgrowth. And the right opportunity might be that this patient is constipated. So struggling with adequate bowel elimination can cause overgrowth of these bacteria. In addition, if you don't have enough stomach acid, these bacteria have the opportunity to grow and flourish at levels that they might not be ideal at. And this really was the cause of the bloating that she was experiencing. In addition, the GI MAP test measures your large intestinal bacteria. It doesn't directly measure small intestinal bacterial overgrowth or too much bacteria in the small intestine, but due to proximity, it is likely that these bacteria had made their way up to the small intestine, and that's why we were seeing that upper abdominal bloating. So this is really something that I wanted to target. I wanted to make sure that stomach acid was optimized. I wanted to make sure that bowel movement was optimized and using a broad spectrum antimicrobial to help lower this overall number. If we just gave a probiotic, expecting that the bloating was going to be reduced, we were not going to see much movement. Maybe it would increase this bacteroides up a little bit, but we're not addressing the root cause, which is this overgrowth here of these opportunistic bacteria that we really had to help lower. So this we're all looking at maybe small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. You could confirm this with a breath test, but we just went ahead with a therapeutic trial of a broad spectrum antimicrobial to help eliminate this. And it worked really, really well. Looking at potential autoimmune triggers, Citrobacter was one that came up. If there is a strong family history of rheumatoid arthritis, a personal history of rheumatoid arthritis, or an autoimmune tendency, Citrobacter we do know associated with rheumatoid arthritis. So if this was something that came up in the health history, this is something that we would want to address as well. In addition, candida was quite high here. So clinically, I do see that elevated levels of candida can create fatigue, brain fog, as well as significant bloating, just because candida, as well as these opportunistic bacteria, they can really feed off of undigested carbohydrates as well as undigested food particles. So this is something that we wanted to reduce as much as possible in this patient, and it really made a big difference. Viruses were all normal, which is great. Parasites normal, worms normal, amazing. Now looking at overall digestion, her ability to break down fats was actually really good. There was no fats present in the stool, which is amazing. And her elastase, which is a marker of pancreatic function or digestive function was actually quite good too. So this is where you really have to work with a practitioner who has a background in treating GI issues. Because if I was just to read this lab report and didn't do the clinical history, with it, I would say that this patient wouldn't need additional digestive support. They wouldn't need additional pancreatic enzymes, digestive enzymes, or HCL. But in this case, because of the overgrowth, it was something that I really wanted to emphasize as important. Even though it, it seemed to be okay on the stool test, when we did a therapeutic trial of HCL, if you have enough stomach acid and we give you more acid, you should feel warming. And we were actually able to get up to six to eight caps of HCL without experiencing burning, which to me showed that even though the GI map showed that um, digestive function seemed to be normal, um, we still wanted to supply more of that HCL. So that was the one thing we did. We actually were able to drop her dose down to two betaine HCL with pepsin with each meal.
she was gluten-free and dairy-free as it is and was going to continue to do so. I, so I didn't see the need to do a broad spectrum digestive enzyme that helped to break down gluten and dairy um, because she was going to be compliant with that as well. So we just chose HCL as a main phase in step one to help reduce the opportunity for those opportunistic bacteria to grow. Her beta-glucuronidase looked good. So this is estrogen recycling from the gut. So we wanted to make sure that estrogens weren't being recycled from the gut and that was contributing to the estrogen dominant symptoms that she was experiencing with her menstrual cycle. So that looked great. No blood in the stool, which is amazing. Her immune system looked really good. So this shows me that the immune system wasn't overreacting to um, any bacterial pathogens were there. No, none of the big pathogens came up. None of the parasites, none of the worms came up. And this showed me that she had a robust immune system so that when we put in these antimicrobials, they would be a really effective treatment for her. If her secretory IgA was low, that's what I would start first. I would want to support the body's own immune system prior to adding in antimicrobials so that the antimicrobials could work with the client's immune system so that it would be a more effective treatment plan. So it was great. We didn't have to do that step. We started with the HCL and the broad spectrum antimicrobials. I'll go through a little bit of the dosing that we used. Um, in addition, her anti gliadin IgA, it was, it was creeping up there. So I would say this is a fairly high result um, for someone who had claimed to not have gluten in their diet at all. So this could be, you know, she is sensitive to gluten and the amount that she's consuming with the cross-contamination that was still triggering it. So for this, I said, you know, this is pretty high for someone who claims to not be having any gluten in their diet. So make sure to continue to find those cross-contaminations and do the best that you can to keep all gluten out of your diet. This one here was quite high. This is calprotectin. This is inflammation in the gut. So the opportunistic bacteria was creating inflammation. She does do a lot of exercise, which could contribute to an elevated level of calprotectin in the gut as well. So after our treatment phase of removing the opportunistic pathogens, we did a healing phase with GI Revive and glutamine and colostrum to help get this down. And this is one of the markers I would recommend retesting because when we're looking at elevated levels of inflammation in the gut, we want to make sure that there's no irritable bowel disease such as Crohn's or colitis. So this is something that we are going to be retesting in the next couple months. In addition, zonulin, which is a marker of leaky gut, is really high. So we want to see, okay, why is this leaky gut so high? Is there other environmental triggers? Do we have to look at tap water? Are you truly making sure that you are avoiding gluten because that can be another one that elevates this level of zonulin, as can environmental toxins and over-exercising. So this is another one that we want to really work on because zonulin is a marker of leaky gut. And if your intestinal cells are open and you're not able to digest your foods properly, those proteins can get through. And we really don't want food particles getting through, triggering the immune system. So the last phase of this treatment protocol is really to tighten up this is on you and making sure that leaky gut is not an issue so that the immune system isn't overreacting to things that it shouldn't be because they shouldn't be getting through. So what did we do? Phase one was all about removing food triggers. So removing the foods that weren't making you feel well, making sure to be gluten-free, dairy-free as much as possible. In addition, we added the two caps of betaine HCL with each heavier meal that had protein in it. In addition, what we did is we did a high dose of GI micro X and oil of oregano. I actually do two caps three times a day of each, and I do that for a shorter duration. I would rather have a treatment protocol that is a shorter duration. I find it increases compliancy, and when clients see results right away and they feel better right away, then they're more motivated to stick with it. So I do higher dose for a shorter period of time, four weeks. And then we cut the dose in half for another four weeks to address the first phase, removing the food triggers, removing the opportunistic bacteria that was growing in there. The next phase was all about repairing. So inflammation here, what we really want to do is an anti-inflammatory diet, whole foods diet, a lot of phytonutrients, a lot of plants, lean proteins. She was already doing that. So we encourage her to continue to do that in addition to taking curcumin. So we did two caps of curcuma veil every single day, as well as colostrum and GI Revive. These are my all-time favorite products to reduce inflammation in the gut and heal leaky gut. And that portion of the plan lasted eight weeks as well. We are still working on the repair phase. 
we are still continuing to add in the betaine HCL. She does do a lot of resistance training on a higher protein diet to put on lean muscle mass, which is amazing. But we want to make sure that we are properly breaking down those proteins. And as we age, also stress will do this too. We actually reduce the amount of stomach acid that we have. So it's harder to break down those food sources. So she's going to stay on the betaine HCL probably for a long time in her maintenance plan. In addition to her maintenance plan, we're looking at a multivitamin. We're looking at making sure our whole foods diet, lots of resistance starts from a dietary perspective, maybe a multivitamin, some magnesium. And the great part is she can now consume high levels of protein in order to hit her macro so that she can put on that lean muscle mass and she doesn't feel bloated after meals. So she responded back saying that she feels completely normal. She has two really great bowel movements each and every day, and she doesn't feel like she's still pregnant. So for a lot of my clients, even water can be a trigger. And you notice that, you know, you wake up, your stomach digestively feels fine. And then anything you add to your system seems to be floating. And that's really from the candida as well as the opportunistic dysbiosis of bacteria. So She's feeling good. She's able to consume her healthy whole foods diet and feel really amazing after. And now we are just in maintenance. We didn't even have to address hormones because cycles are better. No acne, no PMS, no breast tenderness, which is really amazing. So I hope that was helpful for you, giving you an idea of what the GI MAP stool test tests for, as well as some treatment options that we did based off of this particular client. And yes, best thing to do is retest after a treatment plan or at least recheck those key markers that were elevated, such as the calprotectin and the zonulin levels. So if you have any questions, please let me know. And absolutely, if you want to get tested with the GI map, I would highly recommend it. I do it on myself and my kids every year just to make sure everything is optimal and feeling really, really good. So it's not just about digestive health. It really impacts your mood, your weight, your hormones, as well as everything else. It really all starts in the gut. And I, I can't speak highly enough about this test and the different things that it picks up. So hope that was helpful for you. Enjoy the rest of your week and happy holidays.